Hi everybody, welcome to Westlake. I'm so glad you're here. This is our first Sunday in Advent and we're glad that you're here to worship with us. Let's worship.
you're looking for a way to celebrate Advent, here's Elaine to share a message with you about an opportunity that's happening in Neil, followed by a message from Tommy and Megan. Many of us are wondering in this season of Advent, what will it look like to celebrate Christmas together? With the restrictions that are in place, we don't know at this stage whether we will be allowed back inside our churches. But we didn't want to miss the opportunity to celebrate and to be able to share the meaning of Christmas with colleagues, friends, family and neighbours. And so the Neon pastors, French and English speaking, have got together to put together an interactive program where you would be able to participate in Christmas celebrations together. There'll be four different locations in the Neon region that you can go to following the trail of a contemporary Christmas story, which will lead you to discover the secret joy of Christmas lies in Jesus. On a sad note today, um, this marks the last Sunday that Carol, Carly, and Cleo will be with us um, in Nyon, obviously not in person, but in Nyon at Westlake Church. And so we wanted to say goodbye, uh, but hopefully just for a little bit. Uh, we're really hoping that you can all come back and visit. It's been wonderful to have Carly in our youth group and to get to know Carol as well and Cleo as well um, over this past summer. So. Um, thank you for being part of our community, and we hope you can still tune in online. Um, I just wanted to wrap up with a quick prayer for your family. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for Carol, Carly, Cleo, and their family as they move to Brussels. I just pray that you would bless their move, um, that they would find a wonderful community that honors you, that loves you, uh, that will support them in this transition into a new place, into a new school, into a new work environment. Um, and I just pray for, for strength, for comfort, um, for resilience um, in their family, and just that they would bond even closer together during this time. Bless them in their travels. Keep them safe, I pray. In your name, amen. Although this season may look a little different than it has in the past, we're here this Sunday to light our first candle in the Advent wreath. So Cecilia and her family will do that as well as share some scripture with you. The first week of Advent, we remember the gift of hope we have in Christ. The prophets of Israel all spoke of the coming of Christ, of how a Saviour would be born, a King in the line of David. They spoke of how He would rule the world wisely and bless all nations. As followers of Christ, we wait with hope for His return. As we light this candle, we remember that it was from the manger at Bethlehem that He came and gave light to the world. As we light this candle, we are reminded to be alert and to watch for the light of Christ, even in the most unlikely places and people. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the hope you give us. Help us to prepare our hearts for the Lord's coming by being open to seeing the light of Christ in others. We ask this in the name of the one born in Bethlehem, Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Online service for today. I'm really glad you're here. I'm excited 
uh, to be giving today's message. Today is the first day of Advent, uh, which is exciting. It means that Christmas is not that far away. I know it's been a really weird year, but hopefully we can still enjoy Christmas and have some of those Christmas traditions that we're really used to enjoy. I know for me, Christmas morning waffles is just one of the things that I look forward to all year long. Uh, but as you just saw, we are going to call our sermon series for Advent this year, A Messy Christmas. Uh, and I think that that really fits with the year that we've just come through. Uh, but I also think too that, you know, oftentimes we want to present Christmas as something that is all always neat and tidy but sometimes it isn't really neat and tidy. And I think if we're honest with ourselves too, sometimes we want to paint or show our own lives as though everything in our life is neat and tidy, but it's not. You know, we want to have a neat and tidy job or, or a neat and tidy family or a neat and tidy this or that, but there's stress, there's anxiety, there's worry, there are difficulties. And so we want everything to be neat and tidy, but sometimes it's just messy. But one of the things that we look forward to at Christmas, one of the things that we celebrate is just remembering the fact that Jesus entered into a chaotic world. He entered into this world because God is really good at using and saving messy people. You know, and God came to this earth that he created to pull us out of the mess that we have put ourselves in. And that is the God that we serve. And so we are excited for that. Uh, as we get going tonight in uh, particular, we're going to look at uh, Matthew's account at the birth of Jesus. And I think that this is really interesting because he starts off with the genealogy. And he kind of has this, this big web or matrix of, of names and people that we're supposed to know. And it can get really kind of confusing. Uh, but I think one thing that's really interesting when I was reading through Matthew's account uh, in preparation for tonight's sermon... I was thinking actually back to some of the trivia nights that we've hosted here at Westlake. Uh, those are always a lot of fun to put on, and I'm hopeful and praying that we can have another one sometime soon. Uh, but one of the categories that we had at trivia night was famous first lines. And so what we're going to do real quick is I'm going to put up three different uh, famous first lines from a book, and using the, the chat feature, uh, hopefully you can type in and guess and see if you can figure out which book this famous first line came from. You'll have about 10 seconds for each one. All right, here we go. Call me Ishmael. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four Privet Drive were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. You know, Me Megan always makes fun of me because when I say privet drive, she thinks I'm, I'm a muggle who pronounces it incorrectly. But, but there you go, three famous opening lines. Uh, and, and when I think about that, I think about what was it like for Matthew to write the opening lines of his gospel? Because he got to see and hear and be present at so many of these events about the life of Jesus, and he had the opportunity to write it all down. And, and so... What was going through his mind as he was trying to, you know, write down that perfect opening sentence? And I have to be honest, if, if I look at his opening sentence, sometimes it isn't really that interesting. And, and maybe it makes us want to kind of take a nap or just skim over and not pay attention to it. You know, if, if I were Matthew, uh, I would have maybe tried to come up with something a little bit more creative or different or, or catching, you know, eye-opening uh, to get you. And so I was looking through some of the stories that Matthew tells him. If I were him, you know, maybe these are a few of the opening lines that I think would have fit. You know, maybe he, he could write, the storm was all around us, the waves were crashing, and the lightning illuminated the massive waves that were crashing against our boat until he spoke. 
And, and I'd read that and say, wait, wait, who is the he that he's talking about? What did he say and what happened in the midst of that storm? In my opinion, that would be quite interesting and, and get my attention. Or maybe another one, you know, he could say, we were in the boat and he was walking on the water and he said to us, take courage, do not be afraid for it is I. And, and I would read that opening line and be like, wait, someone's walking on the water? Who's walking on the water? What, what's going on there? I, I want to know more about this person who can walk on water. Or maybe similar to, to one that you just saw, uh, just being keeping it short and simple, maybe Matthew could have used the two words that Jesus spoke to him that I think radically changed his life. Follow me. And, and maybe... Those would have been, in my opinion, good opening lines, but Matthew starts with, this is the genealogy. Because he wants us to take a look at the family of Jesus. He wants for us to look at the people in the line of Jesus so that we can better understand and better know who is in Jesus' genealogy. You know, and I think that's something that in our day and age right now has become kind of a, a fad, something that we look at because there's a website called Ancestry.com, you know, where you can plug in some information, maybe give a DNA sample, and you can figure out where your genealogy is and, and your 1 16th that, and you have this part in your family line. And, and oftentimes you'll see people, you know, boasting on social media about who is in their family line. Now, you know, I've seen one that says, hey, I'm 1 16th royal blood. And they get really excited because they have royal blood running through their veins. Or someone else gets really excited because they have somebody famous in their family line. And they say, hey, I am the great, 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 great grandson of Leonardo da Vinci. That must be why I'm so smart and I have all these crazy ideas. Because I am a grandson of Leonardo da Vinci or whoever it may be. But in all the different social media postings you see about the ancestry, I think one that I have yet to see is somebody boasting about their great-great-great-grandfather being well-known for being a murderer. Or I have yet to see somebody boast and, and get all excited because their great-grandmother was a prostitute. But when we look at the genealogy of Jesus, these are the types of characters that we see, the type of people in Jesus' line. And I think Matthew is trying to get us to see that God is really good at using messy people because that's all that there is. And, and, and then as we keep looking at the genealogy of Jesus, we will see that there are no outsiders to the family of God. And finally, when we look at the genealogy of Jesus, we will see that there is no sin too big, too grand, that it cannot be redeemed by God. And you know, as we look at Matthew's genealogy, we will see that God is really good at using messy people. And, and, and we look through and we can scroll through some of the names, and I think one of the first ones that pops out uh, is Abraham. And we know that Abraham, and rightfully so, is, is a very prominent and very important person to the Christian faith. But that doesn't mean that he's without his faults and having done some bad things. There are at least two occasions that we know of where Abraham is entering into a new city and he looks at his wife and he says, Hey, I need for you to tell them that you're my sister. Because if they think that you're my sister, they will protect my life. And so he is essentially saying to his wife, I care more about my safety than I do yours. Because he doesn't know what's going to happen to his wife from a physical standpoint, from a sexual standpoint, mentally or emotionally. But in his mind, he says, as long as I'm okay, it doesn't matter what happens to you. And, and we see this Abraham do it once, and then he does it again a second time as well. But yet we know that through Abraham, so many amazing things happen only by the grace of God. And then as we keep looking through the genealogy that uh, Matthew gives us, we see the name Judah pop up. And Judah is a very interesting character. He was actually one of the brothers of Joseph. Uh, and they had the idea that they wanted to kill their brother because they didn't like him. Uh, and Judah comes up with the idea and says, Hey, rather than kill him, let's sell him as a slave so that we can at least get money for him. And, and so Judah helps sell his brother into slavery. Uh, but speaking of Judah, one of the names that we've seen there is a female named Tamar. 
Uh, and there are only a few women that are mentioned, but Tamara is a very interesting woman. And her story takes place in, in, in the book of Genesis. And she's actually married to Judah's oldest son. Uh, but Judah's oldest son dies, and so per the custom, Tamar marries the next son. But that son also dies as well. And at that point, Judah has one more son, but Judah doesn't want Tamar to marry to that, that son. So he essentially says to Tamar, you have to go away. You're no longer a part of our family. Get out of our house. And, and so Tamar leaves, uh, and, and sometime later, she finds out that Judah is coming to the town that she's living in. And so she dresses up as a prostitute and meets Judah. And Judah spends the night with her. And, and as you read that story, you know, it's not the type of story that you would typically tell around a family dinner, but it's more likely the story that you would hear at a bar after a couple of rounds. Because you have the father-in-law impregnating the, the daughter-in-law. And it is from these people that we get Jesus. But Matthew in his genealogy, when he's telling us all of this, he is reminding us that God is really good at using messy people. Because we all have our faults, we all have our failures. And yet by the grace of God, he is and will do amazing things in us and through us as well. But as we keep looking at the genealogy of Jesus, we're also going to see that there are no outsiders to the family of God. And, and I love looking at the story of both Ruth and Rahab in Matthew's genealogy for this. Ruth was a woman who, who was married and her husband dies, and she decides to go with her mother-in-law back to her mother-in-law's country. And, and as she was going back, she knew that she was an outsider. She knew that she did not belong. She, I don't know if she, she spoke the language, probably didn't know the customs, but as she was going by the way that she dressed, by the way that she talked, people would have known that she did not belong. But it's through Ruth that we get King David. And, and we see that God is saying, it's okay, Ruth, that the world is going to say you don't belong, but you belong in the family of God. When we see Rahab, uh, that, that story takes place in, in Joshua where they are sending out spies trying to figure out whether or not Israel can take over the land. And, and Rahab decides to hide the spies in her house and protect them. And at that point in time, Rahab and the spies would have been mortal enemies. They, they would have had no desire to communicate. Yet Rahab sticks her life, puts her life on the line to save these spies. And just another fun note about Rahab is the fact that she is also a prostitute as well. And so we see another person in the line of Jesus who has a sketchy past. But these women are included because there are no outsiders in the family of God. Nobody is going to stand before Jesus and hear the word said, Oh, sorry, you have the wrong color hair. You have the wrong color eyes. You have the wrong color skin. You have the wrong accent. I'm sorry, you don't belong in the kingdom of God. No, that's not at all what we are going to hear or what we see. We see through these individuals that Matthew is telling us about, that there are no outsiders to the family of God. And, and just the third thing that I think that Matthew is pointing out to us is that he's showing us that there is no sin that is too big or too grand that it cannot be redeemed by God. You know, we already looked at Abraham and, and, and saw that he valued his life as more important than the life of his wife. Uh, but we also see David that is mentioned as well. King David, one of, if not the greatest kings in the history of Israel. And when we think about David, we usually say David and blank. And then we fill that blank with a name. And the interesting thing is it's usually either Goliath or Bathsheba. And it's really interesting because those kind of highlight his greatest victory, but they also show his greatest fault. And we see with David and Bathsheba that David lusted after Bathsheba, and he took her as his own when he had no right to do that and committed adultery with her. And on top of that, he decided that it would be best for him, through a series of events, to have her husband murdered. And so we see that David is an adulterer and a murderer. Yet there is no sin that is too big or too grand that it cannot be used by God. Why is that? Because there's grace. 
There is grace in the kingdom of God. And I think that's one of the things that Matthew really wants for us to see when he's showing us the genealogy. Because the truth is, our history can be messy. Our families can be messy. Our lives are messy. But God is really good at using messy people. And there are no outsiders in the family of God. And there is no sin that is too big or too grand that it cannot be redeemed by God. To close for today, I, I want to share a story that I read uh, from Philip Yancey, who, who is an author uh, and a pastor, as he's talking about the grace of God. And, and I'm going to paraphrase this story from Philip Yancey just a little bit, but he talks about uh, the opportunity where he had as a pastor to serve communion. Uh, and so he stood before his congregation and said, you know, this is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. And he says that over the course of time as being the pastor of this congregation, he got to know the people and he got to know their stories. And so he saw coming forward a woman named Mabel who, who was just broken and he knew that she had been a prostitute. And, and earlier, Mabel had confessed to Philip that she had a son at one point in time, but she knew that having a child would not be good for her business. So she sold her son to somebody else. And, and Philip stood before her and said, the grace of God says that this is the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. And, and next came a couple named Christina and Reinhardt, and, and they were uh, a married couple who had German heritage, from, and they came from the Moravian church that is very big on sending out missionaries. And they had always believed in that mission and always believed in that call. But now all of a sudden, it was their son who wanted to be a missionary. And Christina came up with tears down her face because it was a bigger sacrifice than she realized. And Philip said, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Next came Sarah, who, who had a covering over her head to hide all of the scars from recent surgeries for a brain tumor. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. And then came Michael, uh, a man who had a stutter and, and was so socially awkward. Anytime he tried to talk to somebody, he would just freeze because he was so scared and so self-conscious of his gut stutter. This is the body of Christ broken for you because there's grace. There is grace poured out. What more can we be offered than grace to fix all of our mess? And that is the beautiful thing, and that is what we get to celebrate, because when we hear this story from Philip Yancey, I recognize that those people he mentioned, they're, they're me, and they're you. Broken people who need the grace of God. And so as we get started with our Advent series this year, uh, maybe... I hope that you just need to be reminded of the grace of God. Or maybe you need to hear for the first time that there is grace. And it doesn't matter what your past is because God can redeem it. You know, following Jesus is not about pretending that everything is neat and tidy. This is about how our story is changed because of his story. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't what, matter what your family is, what your story is what your messiness is, there is grace. And there are no outsiders in the family of God because there is a place for you in God's family. So I guess when Matthew started his story by saying, this is the genealogy, he knew what he was doing after all. Thank you for joining us on this first Sunday in Advent. We look forward to spending next Sunday, the second Sunday in Advent with you as well. Have a blessed week.